Manscaped is here to up your body grooming game. Manscaped has the revolutionary electric trimmer, the Lawnmower 3.0. It's cordless, it's waterproof, and it's guaranteed not to nick or snag your nuts or your chest because you can use it upstairs and downstairs. So go to manscaped.com, use code HRU for 20% off plus free shipping. Hello, everybody. Welcome back to Holly Randall Unfiltered. Today, I have a very special guest. She is an award-winning author, sex educator, columnist, uh, and podcast host. She's actually part of the podcast collective, Pleasure Podcasts, which encompasses myself, her podcast, and a bunch of other sex-positive podcasts. I am talking, of course, about Tristan Terramino. Tristan, how are you? Hi, how are you? You're very pregnant. You won't be I'm, when this airs. <laughs> no, no, I won't be. Yes, I am. Very, I, I was thinking about that. When I stood up, you could probably see how enormous I am at this moment. Um, it's yeah, just when this in your belly, though. It's just in your belly. <sighs> they, well, I don't know. This is a little. No, it's got a it's little bigger, at too. Not at all. No. I like how we're starting off this podcast talking about how great I look. <laughs> <laughs> But uh, how how are you doing? I've wanted to have you on for so long, so I'm so excited to have you here. I know. And I'm a captive audience. Not only is the pandemic happening, but there's fires. So I'm literally stuck in my house. Fantastic. Yeah. Thank you. I, <laughs> I have hours to talk all day, in fact. <laughs> so um, just uh, I wanted to kind of let my audience know. So I mentioned, of course, that Tristan is a writer. And actually, the first time I met Tristan was when you profiled my mom and I for the Village Voice. Yes. That was that, so long ago. So long ago. And that was, was that the, like in the year like 2001 or something? Probably. Because I think I started working for my parents in like two, 1999, 2000. Um, and I remember I was so excited because that was the first like big media like coverage that I ever had. That was my first one. I remember I got the article. I saved it. I was like, oh my God, I'm famous now. <laughs> <laughs> it's so funny to think like we've been doing this for a really long time. <laughs> I know. I know. It's crazy, right? Yeah. 22 yeah. years. Oh my God. And, um, and then I shot pictures for your book. Was it the guide to anal sex? No, you shot books? the pictures for the G spot for the G spot book. Oh, it was G spot. Okay. Yeah. It was, you that. shot, you shot pictures for the, the, um, what's it called? Uh, I think it's called great G spot stimulation and squirting why am i not remembering the name of my own book okay well, so book on a lot of books <laughs> and then and then there was also a book on sex toys the big book mm -hmm. of sex toys and you also shot that and we shot it at a beautiful beautiful house which i think was in like the pacific palisades or something that's all i remember it was very beautiful was it the one did it overlook the ocean yes uh that was howard's place oh um, yeah. Or Harold, Harold's place. Yeah. He was, uh, he was amazing. It was like one of my favorite places to shoot. And then he got married to a woman who did not appreciate, um, any kind of like nudity oh. shot at the house. And so then that stopped. It was too bad too. Cause that place was the natural fantastic. light in that place. It was like a whole wall of windows. Oh yeah. Spectacular. Yeah, I don't know why I'm nerding out about the natural light, but I am. <laughs> well, natural light is a beautiful light. I, I'm utilizing the natural light right now. And I yeah. tell people all the time, window light is your friend. That's right. Absolutely. So how long, so you've written eight books, is that right? Yeah. And I, you know, I sort of got my career started um, in terms of like national exposure, definitely at The Voice. And at the mm -hmm. time, the only person writing about sex for weekly newspapers was Dan Savage. And I was sort of like opposite him in the paper itself. 
Um, so yeah, it was, you know, it, again, I started my column in 99 and it went to 2009. So it was, uh, in the early days, I was really one of the only people, but I had this amazing publisher and editor where I was like, I want to cover the porn industry and do it well, not stupidly and not like to sensationalize it. Cause there's these amazing people and they were, they were totally supportive. They loved it. And, and that's, I mean, that's kind of rare now, but especially rare back then. Yeah. Have you seen like a huge change in the way that people see sexuality and the adult industry and just talk around sex in general in the last, I don't know, decade or two? I mean, the answer to that question is always yes and no. I mean, I would say no in the fact that I lecture at a lot of colleges and universities and I still meet 20 year old girls who don't know where their clitoris is or how it works, you mm. know, or just young people who don't know basic sex education, who got abstinence only sex education in high school and who really never got any information about pleasure, any information about LGBTQI plus identities. So so we're stuck in a place that we, in some ways, were stuck in before. Now, things have changed, obviously. When I wrote the first edition of my anal sex book, I, you know, I couldn't get media coverage. I, I could barely get a shop to like host me or carry it. You know what I mean? And this was like right at the beginning of Amazon. It was in 1998. And now I feel like everyone's talking about anal sex. Everyone's talking about pegging. Anal sex is like this blase thing that Cosmo like mentions every once in a while. That's like so not a big deal. And so in that regard, it's like, wow, like cultural norms have shifted and what we're talking about has shifted. In terms of porn, I mean, obviously we've seen like crossover success of people who are doing porn and then have some amount of success in the mainstream world. But I think behind closed doors, there is still such incredible, incredible stigma. Mm. And so it may be out more out in the open, but I still think people are, do not consider sex workers uh, equal to them do not consider sex workers, you know, deserving of rights and of job protections and all of that stuff. I think people still have this sort of puritanical view of sex work that like harkens all the way back to when, you know, the English people came to this country and stole it from indigenous folks. Yeah. So there's like the, the puritanical stuff kind of rears its head all the time. Mm. And that is disappointing to think it's so firmly rooted in who we are as United States citizens that there's still a whole group of people who look down on sex workers. Yeah. Yeah. I can um, definitely attest to that. That is such a common thread that runs through almost all of my interviews. Yeah. It yeah, the crazy stigma that one faces. How did you get into um, being interested in sex education and sex positivity in the first place? Right. So that was also a long time ago. There's going to be uh, listeners who aren't weren't yet born. But in the early 90s, <laughs> I was in college. And I mean, for me, I was a really sexually adventurous, kind of precocious teenager and young adult. So I found sex to be fascinating, both physically and also emotionally and also intellectually, right? I felt like it was just, there were endless possibilities. Like you would never run out of things to talk about sex, to think about sex, or to have sex. And so I did a lot of sexual experimentation. I kind of became that person that people would come to and like ask advice because they know I wouldn't judge them. And they know I'd had like as much experience, you know, or more than they had. Right. So I could sort of say, oh, you're having your first threesome. Let me just give you like a few pointers. Um, and I really thought I was going to be an activist lawyer when I was at college. I applied to law school. I was like ready to be a public defender and to, you know, 
provide legal rights to people who are being fucked over by the system, all of that. But when I got to my senior year, I was rejected from every law school I applied to because my grades were really good and I went to a really good school, but I had average LSAT scores. And everyone told me not to worry and that they would look at me like my whole picture. They did not. They looked at my LSAT scores and they were like, no. And as you might imagine, like my brain, I'm, I'm okay at standardized tests, but it's not the way my brain works best. Mm. So I had been writing a senior undergraduate thesis, which, um, you, which you could do at Wesleyan, which is where I went. And there was a lot of sex in it. There was some lesbian porn. There was some BDSM. And I, I did original research. I interviewed people. It was really fun to write. And my thesis advisor, when I cried in her office about not getting into law school, was like, well, I don't really think you want to be a lawyer. I, I think you actually want to write about sex. And I think you're good at it. And I was like, but that's not a job. You know, I mean, certainly people were writing about sex on the sort of fringes and in queer community and stuff. You know, Betty Dodson, Carol Queen, Deborah Sundell, Susie Bright, all these people. But I didn't think they were making a living doing that. The only person sort of out front who was making a living around sexuality was Dr. Ruth Westheimer. And Mm. I didn't want to go to medical school. And I certainly didn't want to be a a charming sort of grandmothery figure, right? That like wasn't my jam. Yeah. So I was like, okay, I am passionate about writing about sex, but I don't think I can get a job doing that. Mm-hmm. And but you and so did? I I well I started writing about sex, and I mostly was writing fiction at the beginning, like erotic fiction, which was essentially all true stories with like a few details, <laughs> a few details sort of changed to protect people. And I did this, I pitched this collection to Cleus Press called Best Lesbian Erotica. Um, that was in 1995. And they said, great, we'll publish it. It was going to be a yearly collection. And then they sent kind of a mass email out to people saying, we're taking submissions for a new series we want to do about sexuality. And we want it to be about very specific subjects. We're not looking for a kind of encyclopedia joy of sex kind of thing. And so send us, you know, send us what you think you want to write about. And I was like, okay, I'll write a proposal. And so I wrote a proposal for the ultimate guide to anal sex for women. They were a little bit like, at the beginning, they're a little bit like wide eyed, like, um, maybe we shouldn't start with this. Maybe we should maybe like warm up to this, which is appropriate for anal sex. But was I was actually play. the first book in the series. The series continues today. Um, and I wrote that book because it was a book I wanted to have on my own bookshelf. Right. Mm. I felt like I really loved anal sex and there weren't a lot of people talking about it. The way that I got information mostly was around um, gay men and men who had sex with other men through like community resources, like gay men's health crisis and stuff like that, where people were talking really openly and really specifically uh, about sexual practices because of the AIDS pandemic. Mm. It, It sort of forced people to start having conversations that they weren't necessarily having before. So I learned a lot, but not about women. And I never kind of heard a woman's voice. There was only one book. It was written by a man. So I felt like, I think I have something to say from a different point of view. And so I did my research, I shared my experiences. And then from there, I sort of had a light bulb moment. I can get up in front of a room full of strangers and talk about really taboo topics share my knowledge and information. And like, this is where I'm meant to be. You know, it was, it was like, oh, this is what I'm supposed to be doing this. Of course. Okay. I got it. And then how was the book received when, um, it came out? Well, this is a funny story that I know you'll appreciate, which is that I was still working a corporate nine to five job. I was working in advertising on Madison Avenue and like I had to wear pantyhose every day. Um, (laughs) <laughs> That's how I characterize. Like, do I need to explain any more than that? <laughs> and my boss, though, 
knew about that I had this other life that I was that I was writing about sex and stuff like that. So that he was super cool. So um, I was kind of doing my own publicity. This is a small press. At the time, there were only three people working for the publisher. And a friend of mine who I worked with, Don, said, you know, you really should send your book to Howard Stern because I'm a huge Howard Stern fan, Don was, and he's obsessed with anal sex. Like he's going to love this. And I was like, okay, but he's Howard Stern. Like, <laughs> yeah. don't you think that's like out of my, you know, pay grade? And he was like, listen, it was, it was literally down the street when he was doing terrestrial radio, it was on 57th street. And he was like, put together a package. You can hand deliver it. You'll write a funny note and we'll just see what happens. So I did that. And they booked me on the Howard Stern show. Wow. My first media appearance for this book and probably like my fifth media appearance in my entire career was on Howard Stern. Wow. And at that point, people weren't really hip to Amazon. And so we had an 800 number that people could call and mail order the book from the publisher. And it sold out of the first printing within a week. That's amazing. I mean, it was the craziest experience. Um, and also when I got there, you know, one of the things that really, uh, like surprised me and sort of shocked me was he had actually read the book. <laughs> <laughs> so like they wanted to make fart jokes and they wanted to like put these funny noises over my voice, all that stuff. And they, and he wanted to be sort of sexually inappropriate, which is obviously his shtick. Yeah. But then he would, then he would refer to stuff in the book. And I was like, Oh shit. He, he read the book. <laughs> so thank you Howard Stern you probably are uh, you know partially responsible for why anyone knows my my freaking name <laughs> yeah that's amazing and then I mean your career is obviously like taken off since then um, yeah so more books more teaching classes more lectures and then as you know I spent uh I, I, I dipped my toe in the water of porn and then uh went back to what I was doing and then I came back to porn and worked for about seven years making you, sex ed videos and also porn. I was just gonna ask you because um I, I know that you did like kind of porn, but like educational porn. So tell us a little bit about that and how that idea came about, because I feel like there's more of that these days, but I think still not really enough. I mean, right. you know, one of the problems that we're facing is that a lot of like kids are now accessing porn very easily on the internet, but not por educational right. porn. So how, how did that work for you? Yeah. So when I taught my workshops that were based on the book, and this was this was a way to sort of get the information out there and get people talking about anal sex, which at that time was very taboo and not, it was not cocktail party chatter. You know what I mean? Which yeah. I think now in certain situations it is. Depends on who you're hanging out with. I know, now. I guess I'm a little <laughs> bit of a bubble, but, um, but I wanted to promote the book and I wanted to sort of get my ideas out there. And so people would come up to me at the end and say, Hey, you know, you should make a movie based on this. And it's true that as an educator, like people have different ways of learning, right? Some people are visual learners. Mm. And I came of age, you know, in the late eighties and the early nineties, I didn't have a lot of baggage around porn. In other words, um, I didn't like see porn for the first time and think, oh my God, that's horrifying. Oh my God, I'm super confused. What the fuck? This is like traumatized me, which mm. happens to a lot of people. I, you know, was introduced to porn through like lesbian feminist porn, like on our backs. And I was like, oh, this is cool and it's political and it's hot. And oh, porn can definitely be fantastic. Mm -hmm. And I knew that if I was going to do an anal sex movie, like I didn't want to do one where I was just talking or maybe showing diagrams. Like I was like, I think people need to actually be having anal sex in my movie. And of course, mm -hmm. if they're having anal sex, I'm making a porn movie. Right, right. So I wrote a proposal, which is funny because people don't do that in porn, or at least back in the in 1999, they didn't. <laughs> and I sent it around to all these companies. I went to a, a couple, I went to like the World Pornography Conference and I networked and I sent it to the big companies at the time. And they all either didn't call me at all or just said no. 
Mm-hmm. Cause I was like, I want to make this video and I want it to be like super educational and from a woman's point of view, but I also want it to be really hot. And they were like, what language are you speaking? You know, yeah. at that point, Candida Royale was on the scene as an amazing, you know, trailblazing feminist pornographer. And I think Vivid and VCA and Wicked were doing like some couples films, but really the only person who'd done educational was Nina Hartley. Mm. And she and and her stuff was like wildly successful, but no one copied it, which is weird because in porn, everyone copies everything. This is true. Um, <laughs> so finally, many, many weeks later, John Stagliano called me on the phone. Wow. Uh, which I know like your, your listeners have to know who John Stagliano is, right? He's he he's a a sort of major figure in porn, really well right. respected. Right. Some shit's going on now about, but yeah. Anyway, we've cov- which we've covered oh, on this covered podcast. That. Okay, great. Yeah. I, I had him on. I want to say like, he's a problematic fave, right? Like there's, he's a complicated person and there are complicated is a good way to put it. And there are people have multiple experiences. I had a good experience. True. Right. Um, and so he called me and he was like, I, I read your proposal. <laughs> Thanks, John. Um, and I want to make your movie. And a bunch of things fell into place. And then I was making my movie, The Ultimate Guide to Anal Sex for Women, with Evil Angel. It was a two-tape set. It was VHS. She couldn't fit on one VHS tape. So it was a clamshell. And it got a ton of press. It got a ton of awards. It was a really big deal. Wow. <laughs> Yeah, and it's so interesting that it was Evil Angel too, because they're so well known as like a kind of hardcore, really for men yes. company. I'm so right, like it wasn't it wasn't one of the couples companies. It yeah. wasn't Adam and Eve, who I would later work for, which right. did Nina's thing. I mean, it was yeah, it's like sex education and Gonzo and hardcore anal. Right. Um, but that was the kind of stuff I was into as a viewer. I I really I loved Buttman, and I. I also loved women's asses and, and the way he sort of took his time with women's butts and showcased them was really appealing to me. Mm -hmm. And so I was a fan before I worked with him and I felt like if he gives me enough freedom, I think we can make something that's a little evil angel and a little Tristan. Right. Yeah. 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 All right. Uh, we're going to take a quick commercial break and we're going to come back. We're going to talk about more about um, Tristan's sex education and also uh, her workshops on gangbangs, which I'm really excited about. So hang on, we'll be right back. Manscaped is here to help you level up your full body grooming game. Their Lawnmower 3.0 is a revolutionary electric trimmer. It's cordless, it's waterproof, and it is guaranteed not to nick or snag your nuts. And if you want to use it on your chest hair, it actually has different settings so you can get the perfect length, whether or not you're the kind of guy who likes to be a little bearish or maybe actually wants a bare chest, literally. You can get all of this inside the perfect package where you will find the crop preserver, an anti-chafing ball deodorant and moisturizer, as well as the crop reviver, a testy toner that is designed to give you a pep in your step. If you subscribe to the perfect package, you will get a blade refill for your lawnmower trimmer delivered to your door every three months. So what are you waiting for? Make this your best and most hairless summer ever. Go to manscaped.com, use code HRU for 20% off plus free shipping. That's manscaped.com, use code HRU for 20% off plus free shipping. If you're here, it's probably because you're a fan of my podcast, Holly Randall Unfiltered. Well, that's great because I'm a fan of my podcast too. Now, if you don't know what Patreon is, it's a crowdfunding platform that allows people to make contributions on a monthly basis. Because this podcast costs money to make, maybe even more so than others. I'm obsessed with quality. So since the beginning, I have always recorded in a studio, had a professional sound engineer, and recorded professional video. All of these things cost money, as you can imagine. And I also made a pretty scary decision this year to cut down on my directing gigs so that I could focus more on this podcast, which is why I need your help now more than ever. 
But don't worry, I'm not asking you to give me something for nothing. In exchange for your contributions, I offer so many perks. For example, access to the live streams of all of my interviews, a bonus podcast that I do called My LA Porn Life, Q&As where the stars answer your specific questions, behind the scenes interviews, merchandise such as mugs, shirts, and stickers, access to my private Snapchat, and so much more. You can join for as little as $5 a month and help me change the way the world sees the adult industry and sex work. So take a look around and see everything that I have to offer. I really hope that you'll join and be a part of our little community. All right, so we're back. So Tristan, one of the workshops that you teach, I know you teach so many different workshops and and you're so well-versed in so many different areas of sex education, but what I had honestly not heard of workshops being taught about before was uh, how to arrange gangbangs. Is that right? So yes. this is like favorite subject of mine. So um, can you tell us about how that works? Yeah. So, well, first of all, there aren't a lot of, there isn't a lot of talk out there in terms of education about right. gangbangs and there, yeah. and there, I don't, I don't know any workshops. I'm sure there are some, but it's not, like on the roster, when you go to your typical like sex shop or website, like it's just not, people aren't talking about it. Right. I'm, I'm really passionate about this because I feel like we have a very rigid, stereotypical idea of what a gangbang is. And I feel like it's time to reclaim that. So we don't need a new word or a new phrase or a different thing. I'm saying keep the gangbang, but let's make it much more expansive. Let's create things where people who have different bodies and different sexual identities and different genders and different sexual preferences can all come together and do this fun thing, you know, rather than default to this kind of one woman surrounded by five or more men and they're sort of dominating her and having their way with her. And, you know, that, that gangbang that we think of is just, is very repetitive. And I'm here to say like, why don't we define gangbang as a scene where there are multiple people and they're all focused on one person who I call the one. And then it's literally open to imagination, right? So one of the things I do in the class is I'm, I'm talking about sort of like protocols and how to be a good host and, um, and safety issues and how to negotiate up front and, you know, set your limits and how to find people and sort of vet them, right? So I'm, I'm giving you practical tips, right? But then as I go along, I also give examples of different kinds of gangbangs that are kind of like outlines for people to then fill in for themselves. So if we were to imagine a scene with multiple people on one and it didn't have the sort of stereotypical elements of a traditional gangbang, what would it look like? So for example, what if there was a gangbang where a guy was at the center of it? Okay. Uh, yes, they call that a reverse gangbang. They bang call that a reverse gangbang, right? But so, or what if we had a gangbang where the person at the center was being worshipped mm. and adored and everyone's job was to meet that person's needs, was to tell them that they were beautiful. So verbally, sexually, physically, to just literally lay at their feet and worship them like they were a god or a goddess. Mm. Or what if we had one where people, where like people aren't talking? What if like someone wants to have a sort of sensory deprivation one, right? That's more difficult to negotiate because then like you really got to negotiate upfront what the limits are and everyone's going to kind of like stay in line, right? Mm -hmm. um, and so my point in all of it is to give people like ideas and examples of how they might craft one. I mean, this really all came about when I was planning a gangbang for my boyfriend at the time, who's a trans guy. And I was at a swingers event, which I 
sometimes find myself at. I was teaching classes there. And this was a pretty uh, progressive swingers event, a lot of people identifying as bi, including the men. And so I went around, I, I, I sort of got to know everyone for about five or six days. Uh, some people I already knew going into it. And then I went around and said, you know, I want to invite you to this gangbang for my boyfriend. And nearly all of the cis men who I asked were like, oh, uh, gangbang? No, I'm sorry. No. And I was like, you know, they, they, they're sexually adventurous. I've seen them around the resort playing and stuff. And I was like, why no? And, you know, one of the guys was like, oh, when I get in a room full of that many people, um, I get really nervous and I have like erectile problems. And I thought, wait, why do you have to use your dick? Mm. Do you have some, do you have any sex toys? Do you have hands? Do you have a mouth? And they were like, oh, I could do that. And I was like, yeah, you could. And then another guy said to me, you know, um, I'm not really kinky at all. And I'm not into that sort of like dominant alpha male, like I must have my way with you and hold you down and fuck the living daylights out of you. And I was like, right. Did I say that? <laughs> when yeah, I just all of these- gangbang, did, did I say that that's what we were doing? Cause he was like, that's not my thing. That, that's, I just can't, I can't interact with people like that. And I was like, Right. But could you interact with people like how you sexually interact with people? (laughs) Yeah. It's like all these stereotypes were coming up. Right. And once I said to these people, oh, it's not going to be about that. Right. Um, Like, like one guy said, like, I don't have penetrative sex with people other than my wife. Right. So, so they've had negotiated that kind of sexual relationship. And I was like, you know, so no penis and vagina intercourse. And I'm like, why does it have to be that? So I wanted to just expand this whole thing about what it could look like and what kinds of people could be there, what the dynamic is, what the vibe is. Like, listen, don't get me wrong. A a gangbang that involves cis men and one cis woman and they're being super dominant, if it's consensual and everyone's having a good time, I say go for it. I'm like not disparaging the traditional gangbang dynamics. I'm just saying we've got to think about this and we got to expand the definition, right? And so once I gave people permission, hey, um, I'd like to show up, but I'm, I'm, I have a foot fetish, so I just want to concentrate on the person's foot. Hey, I want to show up. I have a dick, but I want to use my hands and sex toys. Great. I want to show up and just watch and comment. Can I do that? In this case, yes. I love the idea of also having a gangbang with a kind of Greek chorus. Okay, so what if the person's a really big exhibitionist, right? But they don't necessarily want to sexually interact with 20 people. They'd like there to be 20 people in the room. But what if they only sexually interacted with six of them? What if the other people in the room were there to actually provide commentary about what they were watching, how much it turned them on, how hot the one at the center was, right? This is a Greek chorus kind of model uh, of... (laughs) I'm, just, I'm sure the Greeks would be like, what the fuck? But that, that's I that's the kind of model for another, right? So it's like, oh, you could have a gangbang and not everyone has to even be sexual or have to touch the genitals of the person at the center, right? Mm-hmm. I'm saying like, let's, let's think of everything we can. And once I gave per- permission for people to do it, it was a wildly successful gangbang, if I do say so myself. I'm really good at that. <laughs> um, And it made me realize, hey, you know, I only got to interact with 10 people and tell them what my vision was. Um, Maybe it would be useful to share this with some other people. (laughs) And And actually, one of my inspirations was porn, believe it or not. Mm. So one of the first gangbang porn scenes I saw was um, Shayla Laveau. Do you remember Shayla Laveau? Yes. Oh my gosh. Thank God you do. Cause otherwise I just feel so old. <laughs> no, so, and do you remember the series, the violation of dot, 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 the yeah. violation of Chloe, the violation of Shayla, the violation of Jane, right? Yep. It was a gangbang scene where it's five on one and they were violating the person. And there was like an mm-hmm. all girl version and a mixed gender version. Um, so Shayla Laveau did one, I think it was directed by Ernest Green and I had at that point seen gangbangs where the men are in charge, they're aggressive, they're assertive, they're doing their thing. 
in Shayla Laveau's gangbang, she was like, hey, you, come here and put your fingers in my pussy. Give me your dick. Spank me. She was like sort of shouting orders at these guys around her, right? And I was like, oh, shit. This is, first of all, this is really hot. <laughs> yeah. But also, wait, this is different. This is a different kind of gangbang. This is a gangbang now I would call sort of the queen bee gangbang, where there is a power dynamic at play, but the person in charge is the one. And everyone else has to follow her or his or their orders. You know, gangbangs is a popular topic on my on my podcast. Whenever we get into that, people are always super interested. Because I think you're right. There's There's different... People have this very singular idea of what a gangbang is. And it's always like... The woman is being violated. The mm-hmm. woman is victim and she's surrounded by all of these men who are dominating her. And in a, I haven't shot that many gangbangs. The only ones I've actually shot are ones that were organized by the woman herself. Right. And it was for her company. So Joanna Angel, Riley Reed, Lisa Ann. And those are all three also, boss bitches. Three of like my favorite performers. Yeah. Those and girls know what they want. <laughs> let, me just, oh, exactly. let me just say that. Like they, they're not fucking and around. It, no. And it was actually like a really fun experience shooting those gangbangs because, um, you know, there's, there's always going to be girls that end up doing scenes like that just because it pays a lot and they're right. not really right. into it and they're not ready for it. But these girls like, why I enjoyed doing it so much was they organized it. They picked the male talent. They paid for everything. So they were really, truly invested. And it, uh, those were some of the funnest sets that I worked on. Yeah. Because everybody was so into it. And another thing that's really key with game bangs, at least in porn, because we've got cameras going and we are orchestrating this whole thing, is that the guys have to get along with each other. Oh, that's a big one. That's absolutely <laughs> a big one. And, and, I mean, for me, uh, my ideal gangbang is bisexual. So I would like the guys to sort of touch each other because you can also have a gangbang that leads to group sex, Mm -hmm. right? So say you have an all gender gangbang and the focus is on the one and the one sort of gets all their needs met and then everyone else like starts having sex with each other. That's, that's a gangbang that leads to group sex. Um, So again, which could also be really fun. Um, but yes, the guys have to get along and just the doers, I call them the doers. The doers have to get along and have to also kind of respect each other's space and time and not, you know, not hog the one and not, you know, take up too much time. And yeah. 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 If you, if you watch them from like a pulled back perspective, if you're on set, cause usually, you know, like the camera angle is pretty close. They always cut the guy's faces out and it's always about the girl. But if you're like sitting back and watching the whole thing, it's amazing to actually watch the silent communication between the doers, as you say. Yeah. Like a guy will be in there for a little while and he'll look at the guy next to him and be like, you know, like, you ready? And he's like, okay, yeah. I'm ready. Like, yeah. Okay. Here, yeah. You know what I mean? And it's like, it's, it's actually fascinating to see. Yeah. It's like a dance almost. Well, it is a dance. And again, like negotiation beforehand is so important so that people... So that it it turns out basically the way you wanted it to, right? Like I'm right. all for people kind of getting what they want or not, you know, I, I am for it. And so I feel like there there have to be, people have to really think about what they want, what they want the vibe to be like. Is there dirty talk? What does the dirty talk consist of? Are there physical limits are there things they absolutely don't want to happen? Is there something they absolutely do want to happen, right? Mm-hmm. Um, do they want double penetration? Do they want like someone on either end of them at all times, right? Because that's the other thing is like, it also can be a little more relaxed <laughs> than mm-hmm. this can be important. But in real life, it can be a little more relaxed where people can take breaks, can step out for water, can, you know, all that stuff. Someone can go get the lube and bring it in. And, um, it doesn't have to be like so focused and intense. It can sort of ebb and flow. Right. Right. Yeah. And that, and that happens in, you know, on set as well. Like people need to stop and take breaks and that kind of thing. But obviously we cut all that stuff out. So it looks like it's this fluid, seamless, um, um, 
occurrence. So while we're on the subject of like multiple people, I wanted to talk to you about polyamory a little bit because that's something that, that you cover quite a bit. And I actually have a question from one of my Patreon members about that. And I wanted to direct it. I'm trying to find it. Ah, here we go. Okay. All right. Uh, Dave W asks, what percentage of the population do you think is naturally monogamous? In other words, if there were no stigma on being non-monogamous, what percentage would choose monogamy anyways? I presume that you won't have social science data available to help you answer that question. And that's not your fault. I am asking you to make your best judgment without data to back it up. For the record, I suspect the answer is around 25%. Okay. So yeah, first of all, we don't even have the data to back it up. There there is no research on this. And the small amounts of of research um, that have been done are often qualitative, not quantitative. And no one is funding this research. No one Mm. wants to say, I'm putting my money behind the dismantling of monogamy. (laughs) (laughs) There aren't a lot of people in academia, in science, in medicine who are like, yeah, that's that's where I want to give my $2 million. Right, right. For obvious reasons, right? Mm -hmm. And so, but here's what I would say is I think of gender, of sexuality, orientation, sex itself, the definition of sex, um, and certainly relationship styles as a spectrum, right? So at one end, there is a small percentage of people who are hardcore right? I am absolutely 100% kinky. I can't not have kinky sex, right? Or I am absolutely 100% monogamous. I could never do anything outside of monogamy, right? Mm -hmm. And then the other end, right? The other end from kink would be vanilla, right? So, So they're all on a spectrum. And I think every, most people, majority of people, maybe 75, 80% of people are in the middle somewhere, Right. It's like we're seeing people emerge as hetero flexible or homo flexible, actually. Right. People who are like, I'm pretty much this, but sometimes I like that. Right. And then people who said, like, I would never be kinky. I would never consider myself kinky. But, you know, I tried this spanking thing and I'm I'm kind of into it, like on certain occasions. So I feel like everyone's in the middle, in the middle of the spectrum. Yes, there are people who are absolutely hardcore on either end, right? So there's monogamous people and there's, I'm 100% monogamous. I'm 100% non-monogamous. Can't do anything else. Everyone else in the middle, moving, shifting, changing, depends on their, you know, how old they are, depends on who they're in a relationship with, depends on what stage of life they're at, depends on kids, depends on desire changes and discrepancies, right? So it's like, it's not fixed at all. And we're all moving in that middle space. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's kind of the same thing about bisexuality, quite frankly, um, is I feel like everyone is a little bit bisexual. Like everyone could possibly have these desires. Now, does everyone act on them? No. Does everyone have the opportunity to act on them? No. Um, Are there stigmas in place that would prevent people from acting on them? Yes. But I think, again, if we go gay and straight, I think we're all hanging out in the middle. Hmm. Do you think that, like, a lot of relationships could be saved if people considered not adhering so strictly to monogamy? Like, I mean, one of the one of the things that we see come up so often in media and, and come up in movies and come up in TV shows is the idea of being cheated on being, um, you know, losing your husband to another woman, losing your wife to another man, like the cheating fetish is big in the porn industry, that kind of thing. So it seems like it's, it's an idea that we're so obsessed with monogamy and, <laughs> It, and we're non- so bad at we're it's we're so obsessed we're, with it and we're so unsuccessful at it. Exactly. Like I mean, I think probably like cheating is like one of the main things that breaks up relationships. Absolutely. So how could somebody who's perhaps been, you know, raised to believe only in monogamous relationships, has only been in monogamous relationships, perhaps is in one now, um, could possibly introduce the idea of venturing outside of that. 
Yeah. So I want to answer the first question first, which was like, can non-monogamy save a marriage? And this is another yes, no answer. If you are having major issues in your relationship and you have not dealt with those head on, then going into a non-monogamous relationship is just going to magnify all the shit you haven't dealt with. Mm. So it can't like save a marriage in that way. But it can in that I think we expect a tremendous amount from our partners in monogamous relationships. Like we expect them to be our other half. We expect them to meet all of our needs, physical, sexual, social, psychological, emotional, spiritual, financial, right? We, we expect that that's going to all happen and everything I could want, I'm going to find in this one person, which is a myth and is impossible and sets us up to fail. Right. So I think that's that such, that's such a good point. It, it does. It sets that's us up to fail. And so not that people can't be successfully monogamous, they can, but I'm saying there are issues that come up in relationships. For example, desire discrepancies. Someone has a higher libido than the other person. Someone wants to try out BDSM other person's not into it, right? Um, there are issues when one person, they go in straight and one person discovers they're bi or they're queer, right? These are things that under monogamy can't, monogamy can't tolerate that, right? Monogamy says, okay, then one person's not going to get any of their needs met, or one person's going to be miserable. One person's going to take it for the team, or we're going to break up. But non-monogamy says, oh, great. You're married to a man, you're a woman, and you just discovered you might have interest in having sex with women. Well, that's on the table. That's on the table because we're non-monogamous, right? Mm. So I think, I think certain conflicts, which we see as conflicts in monogamy, don't even have to exist in non-monogamy, right? Mm. You're, you have a higher libido. You have a higher sex drive. You want, you want to have more sex and more different partners than I do. Great. Let's open up and like make that work for everyone. Mm -hmm. Right. So I, I do think it's a way to just address how our expectations are completely out of whack for our partners. <laughs> and, and also just the notion that we can love more than one person at a time. We can lust after more than one person at a time. You know, we, we can have a full range of feelings and desires for other people. And it's not a comment on, maybe who your primary partner is, or maybe who you're married to. Like mm -hmm. we are humans. And, you know, if you read any of the evolutionary biology, evolutionary psychology, you know, we're meant to be around people. We're meant to be a social people. And naturally that also extends to sex. I really liked what you touched upon about the idea that we have these crazy expectations of our partner, that they have to fulfill all these different roles. But I mean, couldn't one be in like a sexually monogamous relationship and then acknowledge the fact that their partner may not be able to fulfill every role and, and, and friends and family could step in to that? I think, I don't know, for me, um, I feel like the key to happiness is usually something along the lines of just managing your expectations. <laughs> Yes. In life in general. And, yeah. I, and I do think that like the media, and I also think, you know, as a woman, I think for me, it harkens back to the idea of like this Disney princess dynamic where, you know, one person is everything to you and true love is this one very specific thing. And I grew up with this idea that like true love was, what was this like one person in the whole world out of billions of people, you're going to find that one person and only that person is right for you. And that person completes you. And I found as I've gotten older that, you know, for me, I think the right person complements you, but I don't think anybody should ever complete you. And I've said this before, and actually this is so weird because I had this dream, um, literally last night, uh, I'm pregnant, so I've been having all kinds of weird dreams. But, uh, you know, I, I'm currently, my husband um, is, it's the best relationship I've ever had. I love him in a way I've never loved anybody else before. But I also think that I'm in a different place in my life than I was before, where I feel like if he left me, I would be absolutely devastated. It would break my fucking heart. It would be horrible. But I 
I would survive. Like I would move on and I would, I would be happy again one day. And I had this dream last night and I've had a few dreams where he leaves me like while I'm, you know, eight months pregnant. Oh God. Right. And in my dream last night, I was obviously devastated, obviously very upset. And, but in my dream last night, I said to myself, all right, well, you know what? You're going to get through this. You're going to pick yourself up by your bootstraps and you're going to get on with life. And the best revenge is a life well lived. Like in my dream, I had that thought. Which wow. I thought progressive. Wow. That's no, that's really amazing. Cause also I think of all my dreams as like, um, uh, fear based. <laughs> You know, yeah. like most of my dreams are like things I fear, like I've showed up at school, there's a big test I haven't studied, right? Yes. Um, and, or like I've shown up at school and I don't even know what my schedule is. That's a big one yes. for me. I've had that too. I don't, I don't know what my schedule is. And everyone's like going to classes and stuff. And I'm like, and people are like, I don't know. Like, and, and I'm at the registrar's office and they're like, we gave you your schedule. And I'm like, no, I don't have it. Um, but that was, so, so this is a great dream because it was like a, a fantasy. It was like, fear and also resilience, which I fucking love. Yeah. I, need, I need to have more of those dreams. Um, note to brain, note to subconscious. Um, yeah, I absolutely think pe people can be happy and satisfied and all of that stuff in monogamy. I just want people to know that there are other options and that, you know, like sexual orientation, like different kinds of sexual practices, you need to like look at the menu, explore it, think about it, maybe talk it over with some other people and I, and choose monogamy in a conscious way that makes sense for you, right? Mm -hmm. As a style, as a style of relationship, not as the style of relationship that we all are supposed to have, right? right. And, you know, again, it's, a, it's about compatibility and some people are in fact more compatible than others. Um, I just think that there are, there are issues that couples run into in monogamy that don't need to be solved by breaking up. Right. Right. Um, so for, for those who might be interested in exploring the idea of non-monogamy, do you have any literature one could? Well, of course I'm going to recommend my to. book. Um, of course. So my book is called Opening Up a guide to creating and sustaining open relationships. And uh, of course there's the, the other just legendary book, the ethical slut. Um, those are, you know, those are the two big powerhouses. If I, if I have to say so myself, there's also a lot of other great books on, on the topic. Um, Dr. Liz Powell has one, which I'm forgetting the name of, but if you Google Liz Powell and non-monogamy, you'll get it. Um, there's, uh, there are also some good books, Cooper Beckett, who has a podcast and talks a lot about swinging and polyamory, the kind of like intersections of those. I definitely think it does not hurt to read up on it. Um, mm. you shouldn't really go in sort of flying blind and you don't have to reinvent the wheel, right? You, you, <laughs> People have thought about this. People have done it. People have figured it out. People have made mistakes. People have figured out what works. And so why not sort of collect some of that wisdom before you start? And, and you know, my recommendation is always that people start slowly, right? That they kind of like set the parameters pretty tightly around them and explore within those parameters to just kind of see how it all feels right? Just kind of dip your toe in the water and say, oh, okay. So when I saw you flirting with that person at the bar, it turned me on. When I saw you flirting with that person at the bar, I felt like I, I had an ulcer and I was going to vomit, mm -hmm. right? So it's like, you don't have to go to the sex party and have sex with eight people to start out. Let's right. start out like in small ways and right. see how everything kind of feels and see where the boundaries are and see what makes you feel secure and makes you feel like, okay, I can go with this. I can totally go with this. And what makes you feel like, I don't know, this is a fucking deal breaker for me because we all have those, right? It's like this weird, delicate dance between what's going to make me feel safer Nothing's going to make me feel 100% safe because it's people interacting. We can't control it. So what's going to help me, you know, feel safer 
while also having my own needs met and my partner getting their needs met and and maybe their wants as well right so it's a it's a delicate little dance and i say go go in slow and don't just sort of dive in mm -hmm. also i think it's really important to have these conversations away from sexual spaces so um <laughs> you know, I always say that if you, if you haven't yet negotiated anything, but like it's on the horizon maybe, and then you find yourself at a place where you might have the opportunity to like hook up with someone or have a threesome or whatever, um, don't make those decisions at the height of sort of lust and turn on. Because when we do that, our brain is not at its most high functioning. Mm. <laughs> There's some like happy chemicals being released. There's some blood rushing to other parts. And so I'd much rather you make a decision and set the rules before you get to the sex party, than get to the sex party and turn to your partner and be like, what do you think? Yeah. Cause that could end up badly or it could end up with people being hurt. Yeah. Yeah. No, that totally makes sense. One thing that I wanted to make sure that we touch on before we wrap this up is your very own, very successful podcast, Sex Out Loud. So can you tell us a little bit about maybe why you started that podcast? Um, what's been some of the most rewarding things that have come from doing that show? And perhaps some of your favorite guests in any particular episodes that somebody new to your show should go check out. Yeah. Wow, that's a lot. There's a lot of shows. So, <laughs> I mean, I've been doing it for eight years. I celebrated eight years in June. That's amazing. Which is a lot. Um, yeah. and I feel like also the identity of my show has kind of evolved, like how, how it started out and how, where it is now. Now I feel like it's a sort of cornucopia of really smart, thoughtful people talking about their passions and it has a more social justice lens than maybe when I started out. And so I want to talk about sex and relationships, but I also want to talk about gender and sexuality and race and class and politics. So, you know, sometimes there's very little sexual content in my show and my listeners thankfully have like come with me on this journey and they like what I'm doing. Um, but I'm, you know, we answer advice questions probably like once every three or four months. Mm -hmm. And I don't have shows about like how to give a great blow job because there are amazing shows doing that work out there. Right. Right. I'm more interested in talking about, like, I just did a show on male bisexuality and all the stigmas associated with it and why bi men have trouble sort of negotiating their dating lives when they come out as bi men. And before that I had a show on sexual assault and these really complicated issues around consent and violation on college campuses. And then, you know, I'm going to do a show about, um, about polyamory coming up that features a new book. I have a lot of books on my show because I'm a, a reader. <laughs> and also sometimes I'm like, Tristan, why did you book four weeks in a row with big books that you have to read? Like, who did that? I did that. I don't know why. So I have a lot of book. I have a lot of people, writers, but I also grab from different places, right? I love to talk to porn people, sex ed people, sociologists, philosophers, people who are really into sex and religion, comedians, entertainers. So I, I like to kind of get a well-rounded and really diverse crowd to interview and, and people who are doing really cutting edge work, who are like thinking right on the edge of what's next, um, whether it's what's next in sexuality or what's next in BDSM or what's next in non-monogamy, right? And so I think my show kind of has something for everyone. And the best thing to do is kind of search, you know, search the main page and with some keywords and then dis discover like kind of what you, what you want. Um, right. Because there's like, li it's literally different from week to week. And the only sort of through line is things that interest me. And I think are fun. To, I want to dig into them more. You know, I want to have an hour conversation with someone about this, not a five minute tweet conversation with someone about this. Um, right. And 
So I think rather than sort of choose the shows for people, um, although I can draw, I can name drop, I'll name drop a few people. Um, I did an incredible show with Stacey Ann Chin, who is a black Jamaican, Asian, lesbian poet and spoken word artist. She read some of her work. She's fucking incredible. It was a great show. Uh, Jean Demby is the co-host and co-creator of Code Switch on NPR, which is a whole podcast about race on NPR. I had him come on and talk about race, especially race with regard to black folks and black men and their sexuality. Um, and then, you know, I did a, a show on adult babies. People have the fetish for adult for being an adult baby or wearing diapers with mm. one of the leading experts on that. Um, I actually got a ton of email about that one from people who practice it. Who like yeah, because that's not something that's not a subject that I see discussed. No, it's like it's ever. fringe and it's actually taboo even within kinky communities. Some people oh, yeah. are like, oh no, but that's that's too much or that's too kinky. Um, so I actually got a lot of people who practice it who really appreciated like, you know, hearing hearing their point of view expressed and also not in a, in a stupid or reductive or you know let's just titillate and then forget it kind of way, right? Um, I, I hope my podcast is smarter than that and more thoughtful than that. <laughs> um, and certainly I have people talking about non-monogamy a lot. So that could be an easy one that people could sort of search for, but mm. you know, body image and, um, sexual identity over the life spectrum. I mean, there's just so many things to like dig into and even, someone writes a novel and there's really interesting stuff going on around sexuality in that I'll have them come and talk about it. Um, I had this comedian Baron Vaughn on who, um, who's in Grace and Frankie and he talked about mental health and what he called his sexual hangups, which he told me about sort of right at the top, like, Oh, I've got some sexual hangups. Can we talk about that? Which is really <laughs> funny. Um, so people from like a lot of different backgrounds talking about a lot of things that somehow touch the realm of human sexuality. Isn't it amazing how, when you think back, when you started writing this little column about sex that nobody else was doing to now where you've got this eight, six years, eight years eight running years. podcast, yeah. eight years running podcast where that topic of sex has allowed you to really reach into and discuss all these different social issues because they all touch upon sex in some way and has just allowed you to like expand the conversations in ways you probably didn't expect back then. It's pretty cool. No, yeah. And it's, I mean, there's two things. One is I remember the first meeting I had with the Village Voice publisher when I had sort of written them the official pitch and we were meeting and they were like, do you think though that you might run out of topics to talk about in a sex mm -hmm. column? And I was just like, um, <laughs> no. And obviously I did it for 10 years. So no, I didn't. Yeah. But what I like about the podcast, besides like having a sort of weekly check-in, which, which I had back then and which I like to have with people, is it's also interactive. Like people call me, people write to me about topics, about questions, um, about something that sort of you know, jumped out of them. I was listening to this particular episode and it changed the way I think about it, or it helped me better understand my transgender sister who just came out or whatever it might be, right? Like that's a really rewarding thing when someone, first of all, takes the time to write you a letter because we're all fucking busy and mm -hmm. says, oh my God, your podcast has had like a real meaning, made a meaningful difference in my life. Um, Isn't that the most incredible thing? Yes, I just got one of those letters and I was like, Oh my God. You know, I was like, I just want to, it's so, it's just really thoughtful that they even take the time to write, which I really appreciate. Um, but then it, you know, that like people are listening, they're engaging and it's meaningful to them. Mm -hmm. And that's what I want my life to be. That's what I want my work to be. And, and think about too, when you first started off wanting to be a lawyer <laughs> and an activist and how you, I mean, you are an activist and maybe the route that you took has changed more people's lives than you would have as a lawyer. As a lawyer. Yeah. We'll never know, but I can win any argument. And I have references to back that up, including everyone I've ever been in a relationship with. <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> well, Tristan, thank you so much. This was so great. I was I was very excited to have you on. You did not disappoint. And um and I'm glad that you're safe. And I hope that you continue to remain safe for now. And um just thank you for your time. Yeah, I hope I I'm gonna have you on my show once you're a little farther into baby, right? You've got to have yeah. the baby and then there's going to be a lot of time getting used to the baby and taking care of the baby or so I hear. I'm not a parent. Yeah. Um, and then I want to have you on my show. Yeah, I would love that. I, it, it's, I've never had a child before, so I don't know what to expect. Um, so I'm kind of just guessing that I'm kind of out for the rest of 2020, but who knows? Yeah. Maybe she'll be really easy and she'll sleep all the time and it'll be fine. Or so. she'll be like in a bassinet on that chair right next to you. And she'll just yeah. be like, doo, doo, I'm sleeping. Mommy's working. I'm sleeping. Yeah. I'm sleeping. Yeah. You never know. You never know. Yeah. So can you tell everybody where they can find you on social media oh, yeah. and all your plugs and all that good stuff? Yes. So my website is my name, Tristan And there you can sort of find all the things I am at Tristan Terramino across all social media platforms you can also find my podcast on podcast platforms. So the Google Play Store, iTunes, Stitcher, Libsyn, all those places, wherever you get your podcast. Fantastic. And it's called Sex Out Loud, again, just to reiterate. And then on your website, people can find all the links to all the books that you've all written. All my books, all, all, all the things. Yeah. Yeah. So that's really like the core. And they can book very... me to come teach them a gangbang class. <laughs> Wouldn't Which, that make I mean, a nice bride's gift or something? Uh, <laughs> oh God, that'd be amazing. Yeah. <laughs> and you guys can find me at Holly Randall on Twitter and on Instagram. If you want to support my podcast, go to patreon.com slash Holly Randall unfiltered. Um, I have a Facebook group, facebook.com slash groups slash Holly Randall unfiltered. And thank you so much for listening. Tristan, again, thank you so much for your time. And I'll see you guys next time. Manscaped is here to up your body grooming game. Their Lawnmower 3.0 is a revolutionary electric trimmer that will not only not nick or snag your nuts, but can also be used on your chest hair. If you get it in the Perfect Package 3.0, it will come with a bunch of liquid formulas to keep you feeling and smelling fresh all day. And for a limited time, you can also get a free travel bag and anti-chafing boxer briefs that come with it. So go to manscaped.com, use code HRU for 20% off plus free shipping.